Uh, so we've been talking about Corinth, and uh, we saw that it's uh, such an immoral city. Paul uh, ministers there. He has a nice team, um, but there's an opposition, obviously, and uh, thereby God sends him a word of encouragement uh, and tells him to continue the work that he's doing. And praise God, you know, once he gets that word from God, uh, where God says, you know, I am with you. Don't be afraid. Speak. Um, Paul does the ministry for, he continues for a year and six months. So 18 months. Remember, we said that's the duration that uh, Paul uh, spent in Corinth. Uh, we thank God for his encouragement that keeps us going so that we can serve the Lord powerfully wherever he calls us. Uh, so in the midst of whatever is going on, we, we can now get the idea that, okay, uh, Paul has done good ministry in Corinth. Uh, 18 months is a long time. In places like Thessalonica, hardly a month is, is what he spent there. But if he's been in a place for a 18 months, definitely some kind of a strong church should have been uh, developed in that place. And Paul should have been able to um, speak the word of God uh, and uh, equip the people in that uh, place. So, uh, yeah, so much has happened over here. Uh, and uh, there is there is a church that is thriving. We saw how uh, he went to the home of justice. Justice is uh, a man whose house is close to the synagogue, but at the same time, Crispus, who is the ruler of the synagogue. So there are people in both categories, Gentiles, uh, Jews, who are all part of this, this church in Corinth. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we find that there must have been like something like a mixed or a, again, if you want to use the term uh, multicultural church that has been uh, placed or uh, planted by Paul. And he has different ministers, including people like Aquila and Priscilla, who are teaching the church, who are, um, you know, raising up strong believers. Uh, so, you know, we, we are uh, happy with the work that has taken place over here. Uh, now, in this church, we'll see that uh, it was a church which had a move of the Holy Spirit. So when we read in the book of Corinthians, we see that because it is in Corinthians that Paul talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the nine gifts and how to move in it. Uh, so he speaks of all those things. But there are other matters, you know, fleshly issues, uh, which Paul needs to address regarding the Corinthian church. So it's a spiritual church, but it's also a carnal church. So there's a lot of hard work in order to really raise up this church as the kind that God wants it to be. So this is what happens in Corinth. Now we can move on and see uh, what happened, you know, once... Uh, uh, God encouraged him. He stayed in uh, Corinth. So in that region, you know, the, Corinth is a city, but it's in the Achaean region. Uh, the Jews get very upset with, with Paul and then they take this matter to the uh, proconsul or the leader. Uh, over there or the authority. And uh, this person, the authority, uh, Galileo, uh, is approached for some sort of a decision. Uh, maybe they wanted to throw Paul out uh, or put him in the prison. So they go to him. And uh, uh, it's always God's mercy, isn't it? Even earlier, we saw whenever the apostles got into trouble, uh, suddenly one of the leaders of the council will say something which will help these apostles escape. So a similar situation happened in Corinth. Uh, so Galileo, uh, he just tells these Jews, he says, look, if it is a matter of something regarding uh, law, breaking the law, then you come to me. Don't come to me with all your religious arguments, you know, your uh, issues about names and words. I don't want to have, I don't have time for those matters. So thank God, you know, Galileo uh, looked at it in that way. And he actually did not engage the case of Paul. So uh, the people got very, very upset with him. The Jews were upset with Paul. But also we find that Greeks, they take a man by the name of Sosthenes, uh, uh, who's a ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him up. So most likely because he believed or he must have been um, a supporter of Paul. So the Jews are upset, the Greeks are upset, but uh, there is no 
case against Paul in Corinth. So God causes him to escape in that uh, sense. And uh, now, after the whole ministry of Corinth, Paul now will move on to his base church, which is Antioch of Syria. So from verse 18, we uh, read on. Uh, would someone like to read, please, maybe till verse 23, 18 to 23, and see the movement of Paul? So Paul still remained in a good while, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Tincheria, for he had taken a vow, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but uh, took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing, and his sail from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Pergia in order strengthening all the disciples. Okay. Thank you, um, Zeli. So we find the end of the second missionary journey taking place here. Um, and uh, what exactly happens is he moves out of Corinth, but he goes with Aquila and Priscilla. And he goes to another place known as Ephesus. Uh, we will talk more about Ephesus later. Uh, Ephesus is also a very key city um, and uh, a city of, uh, um, you know, uh, like they believe in black magic and they believe in uh, spirituality and the occult. So it's, it's one such city. So he goes there, but he doesn't spend time in Ephesus. He just drops off uh, these two people, Aquila and Priscilla, and uh, he moves on because it is uh, seen that he had a vow to God. So he goes to uh, Sencria and he cuts off his hair because of the vow that he made to God. And uh, he goes to Caesarea uh, and then uh, also uh, goes up to Jerusalem. Okay, because he had certain uh, things in his heart to do. And so he finishes all this. Uh, he greets the church and he went down to Antioch is what we learn. Uh, so any idea why uh, Paul could have had a vow? Anyone? Very clearly it says there was a vow, right? That uh, he was practicing. Uh, he was trusting God for something. Any thoughts, any guesses about what the vow could have been and why a vow at a time like this when ministry is going well? Maybe? Okay, so for maybe for Paul to be protected, yes, that's a thought why he may have had a vow. Uh, any other thoughts regarding the vow? Uh, Nazareth law or vow? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, Nazarite, Nazarite vow, that's a slightly different vow, Zeli. That is for um, certain people who took it upon themselves. So you have people like Samson, uh, Samuel. Yeah, I think Samuel is mentioned also. And uh, Jesus, uh, they were all Nazarites. So uh, that vow had to do with not touching anything, which is a grape derivative and not to cut your hair. Uh, so there were some special things in that. But I don't think this vow, which we are talking about, um, is exactly the Nazarite vow. Yeah, but sure, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Any other thoughts on why a vow?
or is a vow necessary like he is already a believer in christ no so why take a vow and all is it valid for believers uh i think it's not necessary maybe but nothing wrong with uh, having yeah. it maybe maybe helps us to have a focus or <laughs> it reminds us what we are doing yeah sure yeah it's not uh, an essential we are not instructed to um, have these vows but if we want to and if we do make a vow the bible encourages us that we must keep it and uh, the reason why paul could have made a vow uh, again you know historians commentators have their own views uh, one is uh, they say protection right like as uh, jafina mentioned maybe he just needed god's protection upon his life as he was living in corinth uh, the other thought is that uh, because it was a morally impure city um uh, it may have been a very challenging time for him uh to live in corinth all the evil things that were going on around him so uh having a vow uh, of some sort and seeking the lord in the midst of uh, the tempting environment could have been a way through which paul kept his focus so there are people who say that also just to keep his focus and you know uh, stay away from the sins of the city he uh, he took on a vow uh, so these are the reasons uh, and uh, today as believers there's nothing that uh, that forces us or that uh, instructs us to have a vow as such before the lord but if we do dedicate our time and uh, we make certain choices maybe it'll come under the category of fasting right so when we fast we just make some decisions that okay i won't do this i won't do that uh, unto the lord and uh, definitely there is a blessing associated with it there is a strength associated with uh, keeping uh, such a determined uh, decision before god so uh, paul practiced it uh, paul was a devout jew like all the other apostles so it must have been a a, a practice in his culture itself and that's why he did something like this now let me just quickly go to our uh, picture of the second missionary journey because we are coming to an end of the journey uh, by paul spending a little bit of time in ephesus by dropping off uh, aquila priscilla okay can you all see properly yeah you can see right uh, all right so we we understood about the macedonian region the achaean region and then we said okay he came to athens he was alone he went to corinth and then he goes to uh, sancria he cuts off his hair here then he comes to ephesus uh, in asia minor he drops off uh, his colleagues over there and though he would like to spend time there uh he is not able to so in the second missionary journey uh predominantly his time is spent in corinth so we need to remember that corinth is the place where he spent a lot of his time in the second missionary journey ephesus was just a stop stop by and then from there he quickly goes off to caesarea and remember we uh, were told that he spent some time with uh the church so what church by church they mean jerusalem so from caesarea he goes meets with them spend some time here with the other leaders of the church and uh, then he goes back to syria antioch okay so this is the second missionary journey about 2 um, to 3 years is the duration of this entire trip entire trip uh, but in the passage that we just read we saw the missionary journey ended in antioch but then again he went back to the region of galatia and he was encouraging the believers we just read that so the third missionary journey has actually started okay uh, so we'll just look at the picture of the third missionary journey and then we will begin to discuss about it okay so the third missionary journey
Yes, here you go. So we just uh, started. We said he went to the region of Galatia. So we are right here from Antioch to Galatia. Same old places like where he had gone earlier. If you recall, you know, the uh, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch of uh, Sidia, uh, Phrygia. So these are all the places that we have discussed about earlier. But you see, now he will come to Ephesus. Ephesus is going to be a major, major part of uh, his ministry. So a lot of things are going to take place in Ephesus. He's going to spend a lot of time over here. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he will uh, go on. He will minister to the other regions where he had been earlier and make his way back, you know, and uh, go on to Jerusalem, finally. So uh, something unfortunate will happen to Paul over here. Though he may have wanted to close the loop to go back to Antioch, you know, he will be taken um, uh, by the Roman authorities, right? He'll be caught by the Roman authorities in Jerusalem, and uh, then you know starts his whole trial. He'll have to be explaining before uh, different councils that uh, he's innocent and that he's really not broken the law, uh, and uh, he still continues to preach about Jesus. So that is what we will observe. But uh, as of now. For our understanding, we came to the end of the second missionary journey. We have just started the third missionary journey. And the most important place of the third missionary journey that we must study about is this particular city known as Ephesus. Okay, So I hope uh, there is clarity. And uh, let's get back into our uh, reading of the chapters. All right. So Corinth, we learned about Corinth. And, uh, uh, you know, the end of the journey and Paul's vow. Now, let's go on. We will read about a particular individual by the name of Apollos. So uh, I hope we are noticing that the ministry of the early church was not a one-man show. Okay, not at all, because there are so many names and, you know, I'm literally trying to keep up with the names because I get so confused with all the names over here. But that is so beautiful that uh, there are different people who are getting saved in each city. Uh, leaders are emerging from among these believers. And from time to time, uh, leaders are being appointed in the in the different churches, uh, and uh, you know the growth of the church is continuing. So, though Paul has this apostolic ministry of overseeing from a distance, the work is going on without Paul in the picture, and that is so efficient. That's the right way of uh, you know ensuring that the church grows in every uh, region and it grows powerfully when there are leaders right we need lots of leaders who are pillars in the church uh, and that's the way that the early church paul the apostles all planned their ministry they worked with teams they worked with other men and women of god so then you keep hearing these names you see when paul went to uh, uh, corinth when he met aquila and priscilla but it was a divine connection. So we need to trust God for divine connections. Sometimes, you know, God brings in those people. They have the right gifting. They have the right, uh, you know, level of maturity. They have the right heart. They serve alongside. And uh, the vision that God put in Paul's heart, he also put it in Aquila and Priscilla's heart. And so Paul could trust them. Uh, and uh, because there was a trusting relationship, uh, he went from Corinth. He dropped off this couple at Ephesus, knowing that, yeah, we are going to work together. You know, we will continue the work of God together. I need you guys with me. Uh, and then, you know, he, he goes on, finishes his vow, comes back to Ephesus. Okay, so that they can work and serve the Lord together. So teams of people, number of people working, uh, uh, you know, uh, together based on the giftings that God has given them and uh, the work of God just thriving. So now we have one more individual by the name of Apollos, who is also a good teacher of the word. Now let's see what the Bible says about this man, Apollos. Uh, would uh, another person uh, maybe read from verse 24 to verse 28, Acts 18? Now, 
a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being favored in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla, Prisca, Priscilla had him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Assyria, the brethren wrote, exalting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Okay. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Christ, is, that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So what do we understand about this man? He's from uh, Alexandria and he's also an eloquent man. So maybe uh, similar to Paul, uh, he had a scholarly background. So eloquent is to be able to uh, convey our thoughts, communicate our thoughts uh, very fluently and comfortably. So he was able to do that. And that's a great blessing. It's a great gift. Uh, an eloquent man, that is the capacity he has. But at the same time, the Bible says, mighty in the scriptures. So that's a powerful combination. He's able to speak well. Uh, he knows the scriptures. He comes to Ephesus. And in Ephesus, we already know that, uh, you know, Aquila and Priscilla had been uh, dropped off there. Uh, and uh, this man, Apollos, he, uh, you know, begins to, in, he begins to um, talk about God, right? So what is it that Aquila and Priscilla find out about him? They hear him and uh, they understand that though this man is well versed in the scriptures, his knowledge is limited to uh, John's baptism. Okay, he does not know uh, things beyond John's baptism. And so, uh, what they do is they take him aside and they actually teach him, explain to him the way of God more accurately. So, uh, again, you see the teamwork there. Now think about this, Aquila and Priscilla were ministering and then they meet this man Apollos in Ephesus. They could have been jealous of Apollos and, and thought that, wow, this guy is brilliant, uh, you know, uh, but it's good for us that he doesn't know everything. He only knows till John's baptism. Let him remain at that same level uh, so that we will have more opportunities in the ministry. You see, they didn't have that kind of an attitude. They People were ready to build up other people. So when they saw that this man is called by God, uh, you know, that, that fatherly heart or that, uh, uh, that um, a sort of a mentor's heart that is required, they had it. And so they felt that uh, if at all this man knows the scriptures uh, even more thoroughly and everything that the Lord has done about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and, you know, about the other teachings that they probably received, uh, wouldn't, it he, wouldn't he be a good minister of God? So they call him aside and the Bible says that they explain to him the way of God more accurately. Okay, that is beautiful because that shows their generous heart, that shows their humility, that shows their mentor's heart. Uh, and so they invested in this man, Apollos. Uh, and uh, when he desired to go to Achaia, so which place is there in Achaia? Why? They, they are sending him to Achaia, but which place is there in Achaia? We just came from there. Paul spent 18 months there. Corinth, yes. So the important city of uh, Achaia is Corinth. Apollos, now that he knows the word of God well, he's wanting to go back. 
he, he wants to go to Achaia. So uh, what the believers do is they write a nice letter and they recommend Apollos and they send him to Corinth because here is a teacher of the word of God who can uh, bless people in Achaia, right? So uh, people are helping each other, discovering, you know, one another's uh, calling and uh, empowering each other so that they can all serve well uh, and that's a, a very wonderful uh, you know group or a team ministry that we see in the early church they were happy to have more people on board to serve the lord and you know as jesus said right the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few pray to the 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 god of the harvest to send forth laborers so we need many many laborers to have done this amount of work in that region uh, only paul could not have done it and similarly today one person is not sufficient to do the work that god has for us so we need lots and lots of people but we need them equipped uh, and that is why apollos though he was a learned man there was a need for him to be equipped okay now come let's go to uh, acts 19. acts 19 is the next stop of Paul, the city of Ephesus, okay, the wonderful city of Ephesus, and the many things that will go on over here. Um, all right, so we shall move there. So what, a, uh, what is uh, a little bit about the city of Ephesus, we'll understand. So similar to Corinth, the goddess Afro Aphrodite. Uh, in the city of Ephesus, there was the worship of the goddess Diana. Okay? And uh, in those days, it is said that uh, there was the largest building in existence of that time which they had built for this particular goddess. And it was even considered among one of the seven wonders of the world. So you know, we said Athens is a fabulous city, uh, Corinth is a fabulous city, Ephesus is a fabulous city. So, you know, he, he is intentionally going to these mighty cities uh, to preach the gospel. So he goes to this particular city and it has this nice temple. And it is said that this temple was made of, uh, you know, pure marble, marble paved streets. Uh, and uh, uh, even, I mean, these are all the things that are reported about this particular temple that maybe it took like something like 220 years to construct it so you can imagine uh, the the uh, you know the value that goddess diana had for these people and uh, how much of time and energy they were willing to uh, spend to build her a temple so again similar to the corinthians uh, the God, gods and goddesses, you know, they had their own, uh, th their expertise or uh, what they could bless people with. So uh, Diana was known as the goddess of uh, like fertility. Okay. And uh, she, uh, it, it was like the image of a multi-breasted goddess and uh, she was worshipped and uh, it was believed that she fell from the sky. Okay, so all kinds of concepts about her and people would actually um, uh, honor her. So in this particular city, when Paul went, one beautiful thing that happened is that uh, it, it seems like he found some disciples over there. So again, the way we should look at this is by now, people were traveling all over the place and a city like Ephesus which is so famous other believers would have come in there earlier so to Paul's amazement or maybe not his amazement uh, there were already some disciples in Ephesus so he comes here but one thing that uh, he finds out is that these disciples who are there in Ephesus they have never even heard about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit baptism. So do you recall any other place where people became believers, but they did not know about the Holy Spirit? And, you know, some leaders had to go there. Any other such incident earlier in Acts?
जस्ट थिंक हाँ करेक्ट या 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 राइट very good very good so uh, jafina was just sharing that uh, there was a sorcerer and he you know asked um, if he could get that power if he paid money simon the sorcerer samaria okay the place where philip went for ministry and people accepted christ but they did not know about the baptism in the holy spirit so peter and john they go there and they minister to them right and that's when the when simon sees them so very similar see for a uh, for a minister of god the responsibility is to help people grow up in god which includes teaching them everything from the word in order to disciple them so one of the truths which the uh, ephesian disciples are missing is the baptism in the holy spirit they are missing about the truth about the holy spirit and you know the manifestations of the gifts of the spirit so uh, when he goes to ephesus he actually asks them do they know about it do they know about the baptism and they say no and then you know he he needs to minister to them with regard to this area and uh, later we will see that uh, an incredible ministry will happen through his life even an unusual ministry will take place through his, through his life some unusual miracles will take place uh, and as a result you know the city will be very powerfully impacted uh, but as we've seen in all cities you know there is uh, a bunch of people who are willing to receive what paul is doing but then there is some sort of an opposition opposition which is also rising up so let's go ahead we'll read it in a few sections uh, we are in acts chapter 19 let's read from verse 1 to verse 10 where this whole matter of the disciples coming and saying they don't know about the holy spirit uh, you know that is happening so yeah who would like to read this section please Yeah, yeah. Okay, Lubega is uh, it's like a marathon for you today, Lubega. And it sure. happens while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, "Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed?" So they said to him, "We have not so much as had, as much as." had whether there is a holy spirit and he said to them into what then were you baptized so he they said into john's baptism then paul said john indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him that is on christ jesus when they had this they were baptized in the name of the lord jesus and when paul had laid hands on them the holy spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied now the men were about 12 in all and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months reasoning and persuading concerns concerning the things of the kingdom of god but when some were hardened and did not believe but spoke evil of the way before the multitude he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the schools of tyna tyranas and this continued for two years so that all who dwelled in asia heard the word of the lord jesus both jews and greeks Amen. Sure. Thank you, Lubega. So, a couple of things here. So, he meets these disciples, and uh, unfortunately, there are two truths that they are missing. One is about the baptism in the name of Jesus, and the second one is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, is it possible for someone to be a believer and not know about water baptism, or not know about Holy Spirit baptism? It's possible. 
we are looking at it right here okay why isn't it the holy spirit who helps us be born again that's true so there are two uh, works that are happening by the holy spirit one is causing someone to be born again and there are scriptures for that that we are born again by the spirit but at the same time the baptism in the holy spirit is a separate experience so though we we are born again we may not necessarily be baptized in the holy spirit and so here we find that the early apostles understood that and that is why when people accepted christ one of the things that they led them into is the baptism in the holy spirit uh, so these believers in ephesus one is they were not water baptized so paul had to teach them about that water baptism and they were baptized in water secondly he had to pray for them for them to be baptized in the holy spirit by the laying on of hands and praise god you know it says they spoke with tongues and prophesied now the men were about 12 in all so this is the kind of ministry that he did and even in ephesus we find that he went to the synagogue where he boldly spoke for 3 months reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of god but when some were hardened and did not believe but they spoke evil of the way before the multitude he departed from them and withdrew the disciples reasoning in the school of tyrannus okay so uh, let me see if i can show you any picture i heard recently there was a a friend of mine who went to ephesus you know she went on a tour to all these places the seven cities in asia minor which are talked about in the book of revelation and uh, apparently they also take you to this spot where uh, uh, the school was believed to be there it was something like a you know school of theology uh, as it is called okay there's no large picture i can only see a tiny picture i don't pick one for you ah okay somewhat big okay all ruins now so don't expect it to be you know nice and shiny uh, it it's all in ruins but you can see uh, you know a structure there and it is believed that when in the synagogues for 3 months he spoke and he was not very well accepted uh, probably there was uh, this person whoever this tyrannus was who opened up his place and he said paul why don't you come uh and you know you take this safer place and you start to teach okay so uh imagine with me one and a half years he taught in corinth so much he would have taught there now he is teaching in ephesus two years he is teaching in this school of tyrannus okay so that all who dwelt in asia heard the word of the lord both jews and greeks so asia asia minor the rest of the continent there in this particular building okay this is all for our imagination people would have come from the entire region okay so in a way school of tyrannus it's like a bible college isn't it so the way today bible college we all spend time we have our schedule morning to evening we learn the word of god so paul would have been faculty over here and people would have come students would have come from all across the region to the city ephesus it was easy to travel to the city so they would have come day and night they are being equipped they are being taught now we don't know how many leaders were raised up through the school of tyrannus but this was one of the most important things that took place in the city of ephesus so yes he taught in corinth uh that was of impact okay people were raised up but we can understand that a lot many people would have been impacted through the school of tyrannus in ephesus 
okay and uh, it's already a city where diana is prominent uh, but look at the ministry that paul is doing okay for a prolonged period of time he's equipping the believers equipping the disciples you know raising up leaders a fantastic ministry that has taken place through the school of tyrannus okay so uh now it's all in we we are we have to paint the picture all over again in our minds uh, through what is being said here in the word of god so both greeks both jews have been uh, equipped in the word of god now remember when we started the book of acts we said the lord jesus he taught and he also healed people so the demonstration of the power of god is another aspect of ministry uh, uh, in other places like philippi paul cast uh, cast out that uh, spirit of divination in the slave girl and uh, you know paul and silas they were caught into the prison uh, so something supernatural took place over there how about ephesus is there anything supernatural that happened through the ministry of paul so the next section actually describes the supernatural demonstrations so maybe i'll quickly read it for us and explain Uh, from verse eleven, it says, "Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them." Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, "We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches." Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, "Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you?" Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded this became known both to all the jews and greeks dwelling in ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the lord jesus was magnified and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all and they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50000 pieces of silver so the word of the lord grew mightily and prevailed so just a glimpse of the supernatural that uh happened in the city of ephesus so we read about something called as unusual miracles there's another place where through the shadow of peter if you recall people were healed so right now we are observing that even the apron or the handkerchief which was taken from paul's body okay now uh, what is this handkerchief about or the apron about it is said that paul as a tent maker used to use these handkerchiefs and the apron you know while he was working so it was nothing special it was just a normal cloth that he used to use in his daily life but even such cloth when it was taken from him and the sick were touched or uh, you know the people with evil spirits were touched they were immediately healed and delivered respectively something so unusual now people ask the question right like how can this happen any idea everyone how can this happen cloth you take a cloth and you touch someone and they get healed does it happen today can it happen today i think um, god is using that as a medium and it can even okay. happen today sure sure that's true john so one of the things we say is the anointing okay anointing or the the power and the presence of the holy spirit is transferable uh, and which is why in this case maybe through the cloth the anointing of the holy spirit was uh, setting people free now this is not for us to uh, conclude that the anointing can go only through medium because you know john said medium uh that that means there must be some material right maybe a liquid or a solid or something that is the medium the anointing gets transferred through it 
but when we consider something like peter god healing through his shadow that's not even a medium shadow is what shadow is a completely different concept uh, but god is not limited he can work through a medium but even if there's no medium he can work so that's the supernatural that we are seeing here so something very unusual took place and even today it's possible it's possible so is it okay to pray over cloths and give it to people what do you think because people were he healed by the cloth no imagine you know one of you asks for prayer and uh, i say okay i'm not able to come let me pray over a cloth i'll uh, courier it to you what would you what would you think about that is that valid not valid i think i cannot limit the, what the holy spirit can do but i for one i wouldn't do it <laughs> you wouldn't do it okay sure 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 okay yeah, uh, i think it depends on situation and circumstances i don't think today we need a cloth today we have a phone call <laughs> there are so many other ways to connect it just depends upon that uh, i believe so like uh, the situation the people the, uh, what can we do more to get their faith and maybe that's in in the end we are all uh, just trying to get them closer to god uh, have that strong faith and uh, like what mean we can use i think we can we can just definitely use it because uh, we as uh, bega said we can't limit the holy spirit but it's not about the cloth that's that's yeah. something i believe so so it's, it doesn't make sense to create them a cloth <laughs> where we can nowadays have calls we can be in touch we can pray over them uh, or, or anything else that we can do but in the end it's about the holy spirit it's about uh, just in part imparting uh, the gifts that he has given us yeah very correct so we can choose an appropriate uh, medium uh, such that people are not offended or it builds their faith uh, in some situations if we feel okay a cloth is necessary then it's okay actually it's fine but we need to let them know that it's not about the cloth like it's actually not the cloth that's bringing the healing uh, to them so as long as people are clear about it that would be good and i know that you know these days we also have some uh, practices like selling the cloth or selling the oil and selling the stuff uh, it's best to stay away from things like that because we don't see uh, such practices in the early church okay uh, and i think with that let's just uh, stop our discussion for today uh, maybe we can pick it up from this same discussion and move in to the next uh, class um, so the online students your assignments are posted uh, please make time to do it and all the best for your assignments e learners uh, your assignments will be up shortly as well okay so let's uh, pray right now and close the class uh, uh, brother lubega would you please uh, pray and close father we thank you for this wonderful 100 hour minutes to spend studying the word of God today. God bless us. Let us not be only hearers, but also doers of the word. And we should also be preachers of sound doctrine. Father, bless yes, our Lord. lecturer. Bless the little ones who are with us. And again, bless us, all the students, and also those who have not been able to attend, Lord. Let them listen to the video when time is available for them. I do pray that we meet next time in peace, not in pieces. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lubega, for that prayer. And God bless you all. Uh, have a, a you know wonderful weekend of worship. Bye for now.